clock on the wall. Would everyone stand to pledge allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. There are no gender adjustments, and we are being videotaped as usual. Um, Where's my other piece of paper? Okay, I'll leave that one for a minute. Uh, may I have a motion on the minutes for Don't November move. 15th, 21st, 30th, and December 5th? Don't move. Second. Situate, second. second by Whitman. Any discussion on any of the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Yes. I, I, I think yeah, I'll do it down there. Uh, student, student of the month. senior from Situate. He's enrolled in the MET drafting program at South Shore Vocational Technical High School. He is a scholar athlete who is able to balance academics, sports, and maintains a co-op job at Sagamore Plumbing, where he uses his skills in computer-aided design to support their project-based work. And here's what the teachers have to say. Kyle spends a great deal of time on his work, making sure that it's perfectly worded, researched, and well thought out. Additionally, Kyle is excellent in classroom discussion and a strong team leader when doing group work too. Kyle's an honor student, student and an excellent athlete. He'll graduate as a four-year varsity lacrosse player. He was a member of the 2016 Vocational State Champion Lacrosse Team and cross country is where he truly shines. He's a three-time Massachusetts Vocational Athletic Director Association All-Star a two-time Mayflower League All-Star, serving as captain in his senior year season. And he was a member of the first boys Mayflower League champion cross-country team, and he saved his best race for last, finishing sixth in the state in the state vocational championship. Kyle has a bright future ahead of him. He's planning to study facilities engineering, and today he's been accepted at Maine Maritime, Mass Maritime, Norwich University, and after this went to press, he was accepted to California Maritime. Kyle, and so I'd like you to please join us in recognizing Kyle as our December 2017 student of the month. Staff member of the month. I think it looks like we've got half of the. Oh, we only have one? Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Looked like we had half the staff. <laughs> yeah. uh, good evening. We're here to honor our staff members of the month, which is kind of unique for us. Usually we have one, but this year, this month, sorry, we're having three. We've chosen three gentlemen, uh, Mr. Scott Gilmartin, school paraprofessional and volleyball coach and girls basketball coach. That's where he is this evening. He cannot be with us. He's currently coaching. Uh, Mr. Derek Mariani, who's our outside crew carpentry instructor, our head football coach and our hockey coach. And he is currently coaching a hockey game at Rockland Rink right now. And our third head is Mr. Madera, who's our senior, senior guidance counselor, who is currently working the basketball game, but I managed to pull him over here so we can have five minutes of a time. He's also the cross-country coach, Kyle's coach. Uh, 
Unlike the Greek god, or Greek mythical dog, Cerebus, who was responsible for keeping people out, these three are about welcoming students into South Shore and their athletic programs. They build teams that teach responsibility, work ethic, and respect. The same aspects we're trying to instill in our students throughout their vocational and academic programs. And I'll read a quick on all three gentlemen. Mr. Morani, as football coach, fields a team of players who often have never played football prior to attending SSVT. However, Derek and his staff not only teach them the skills needed to be competitive on the gridiron, but also winners on and off the field. Mr. Gilwook Martin, as our girls volleyball coach, has developed a program whose realistic goal is the vocational and state tournament year in and year out. Scott and his staff turn out quality teams who are recognized for their commitment, effort, and sportsmanship. This year, the Vikings volleyball team earned the sportsmanship award for the Mayflower League. Mr. Madera, as the cross country coach, has started this program from its infancy to a league champion in a very short time. Joe must draw, entice, and often plead with young people <laughs> about the joys of competing in cross country, the solitude of the runner, married to the team camaraderie, and competition. We congratulate these three men for being recognized for Coach of the Year honors in each of their prospective sports in the fall season. I have your plaque. You got the two gentlemen. Oh, get there. I got a plaque. Right? You get a plaque, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. At this time, does anyone in the audience uh, have anything for public comment? Yes, sir. Oh, no, he's, oh he's just leaving? He's just waving goodbye. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, our Student Advisory Council. Rosa? I'd like to start off by saying thank you um, to everyone who came to help out with the meat raffle. Big thanks to Mr. Mahoney and Mr. Petrozelli for coming and showing their support. Uh, All together we raised $2,043. Uh, for the food drive this year was low, but we did manage to raise over $100 and donate over 100 food items. The toy drive was successful and had 102 donations of toys that were passed on um, to the Toys for Tots. We have been raising student council funds through a sale of candy grams for this holiday. All these funds will help pay for some of our conferences, conference costs. Um, the Heifer Project is a project that one of Mrs. Key's sophomore classes um, did to raise over $500 that went to purchase alpaca, alpaca, flocks of chicken, flocks of ducks, a number of rabbits, pigs, and some honeybees and hives animals for people in Africa who couldn't afford them. The, um, their donations were doubled because they worked hard and got their funds in during a, uh, a March, March year donation event. Uh, the Tree of Warmth was very successful. We donated over 100 items of gloves, hats, blankets, scarves, um, etc. This year to the family, families in need at Father Bill's that services South Shore families. Uh, the ambassadors are selling winter hats um, for $20. If interested in purchasing, please contact Mr. Bello or Ms. Bellatoni, or if you happen to know him, an ambassador, you can see one of them. If you're interested in supporting our boys' basketball team, they are selling gold cards um, that give you discounts and perks at local areas and restaurants. You can find any member of the boys' basketball team who are currently playing right now, or contact any coach, um, any of the Doyles, or Mr. Um, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Student Council will again be attending our Winter CMAS Conference at Wareham High School, where the theme will be opening the doors to leadership. That's all I have for you today. Does anyone have any questions for me? No. Thank you very much, Rosa. Thank you, Thank you Rosa. Can you next time, See you can next year. I win a platter? What? Next time I go to meet Raffle, can I win a platter? <laughs> I thought you did. No. Oh. See you next year. Guys. See you next year, Rosa. <laughs> Okay. Now we'll have the treasurer, Mr. Coughlin. 
Thank you, Mr. Moeller. Again, another tough act to follow, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Rosa, for raising the bar for me. Um, page one, of course, has our cash balances and so forth for um, the month. At the end of November, uh, total cash balance is about $2.8 million. Um, our OPEB reserve, um, $617,000. Um, that continues to grow. Page two has our revenue for the uh, for the month of November. Um, we do the, the second installment of the fees that we charge to our member towns was um, sent out and due to the towns here in um, December 1st. In November, uh, Noel and Situate uh, both paid their dues. Um, there's another item on there in the middle there. Um, it's the surplus revenue transfer, $60,000. Um, as you will remember, back in, in July, the, the school committee voted to um, reduce the assessments for all of our member towns by a total of $60,000 based upon last year's um, the fiscal 2017 results. Um, so therefore, $60,000 was refunded, was reduced, the assessments were reduced for this fiscal year by $60,000 based upon last year's results. So that $60,000 is, is an item there in the front of the middle of page two. The other revenue that we received, um, we receive our um, Chapter 70 money, again, like clockwork, 12 times a year. Um, and we also plug in the non-resident tuition, which is the $301,000, which was the money that we received last fiscal year for the students that attended out of district. Um, that revenue, as always within the budget process, is collected in, in fiscal 17 and is, is applied in the revenue for fiscal seven, uh, for 18 and it helps reduce all of our member towns assessments. So overall, the revenue for the, for the month was a little over $900,000. Everything's on track. And since um, the end of November, all of our member towns have paid their assessments um, as scheduled, so everything's in good shape. Page three is the expenditures for the month. Again, um, this month we spent $979,000. Again, the majority is the payroll, which is the largest line item in our budget. Everything else is running as um, as expected on schedule. Um, there are no glaring um, problems with the budget. There are no uh, unexpected expenses. Um, Sylvia and Pat do a wonderful job in maintaining. I know Bob and Chris and, and Jack are signing all the warrants this, this, this evening. Um, and as they go through the pages, they can see all the detail involved. So they do a great job of keeping things up and running. So overall, we're in great shape um, for the finances through the end of November. Thank you, Jim. May I have a vote on that part Motion. of the report? Motion. Hanover? Second. Second by Hansen. Any discussion on that part? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. I did a question with Jim. When, do we, uh, when does the insurance stuff come up again? Our insurance renews on uh, July 1st. Okay. Right. So you. we, we usually meet with um, Charlie Rourke sometime the end of May review all of the upcoming insurances, get some idea of what the renewal costs are. I mean, okay. for the budget purpose that we're going through, we'll go through and make estimates based upon Charlie's input on where the insurance market is going. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show up and, you know, I just get confused with the end of the year and fiscal year. So no, it, it, it is a July 1st renewal right. on that. Thank you. Um, the other thing on the, um, under my heading is the, the year-end uh, DESI report. Um, that report is filed every year on September 30th, um, and it was filed timely this year. Everything's good. Um, that pretty much every school district in the in the state files a report with DESE, and they pretty much accumulate all the data, and they figure out all the school spending and the net school spending and all the requirements for all the, the towns and districts and so forth. It's also a, a number that when we submit all of our transportation numbers, that's the number that they determine what our reimbursement rate will be every year. Um, as again, as, as Tom is about to present the budget, um, last year was a, was one of the best years in recent history where they they reimbursed our transportation costs at a rate of like 73 percent. Um, in previous years, it's been in the 50s or 60s in that percentage range. Last year was 73 percent, so we we had a bonus at the end of last fiscal year, um, and we did increase the budget last year to to reflect the fact that we were expecting a little bit more. Um, for regional <coughs> the desk report is all, all put to bed, um, all filed, and everything's in good shape. Uh, 
all the students are in the right town? We don't have any shortages or overage? No, I think we agree this year. Yes. Okay. Yes, Thank you. We're good. <laughs> And the other thing is um, we do not have any budget transfers this month, so okay, everything's, okay. everything's good. So. All right, thank you, James. You're Chairman, first of all, I want to introduce Mr. George Cooney from Cohasset. He's our new school committee member. He was sworn in last week, and he's got enough interest. He's been coming to our subcommittee meetings for the past two weeks to fill in, to just to see observing. and. Uh, she has a lot of interest in us so far, and we sincerely hope that he becomes a great member for us. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. It's great to be here. Thank Welcome you very aboard. Much. Look forward to learning a lot. Uh, the other thing I have is I want to uh, thank the Culinary Arts Group, Culinary Arts Group, uh, for the great pie sale this year. In my opinion, they were the best pies we've had besides. And I understand they sold out, and there was a waiting line up to Man's Corner yeah, and, about. and to uh, get in here. And uh, I believe there's going to be some movement to maybe change our way next year and deliver more pies in a more orderly fashion. But I want to thank them for the great job. And I want to thank our sports group for the football win on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, they don't usually get much coverage, but uh, I thought we'd recognize them from the school committee this year. They had a good win. Uh, subcommittees, uh, capital projects, we'll let Tom do that one. But uh, we had uh, a subcommittee meeting Monday night, uh, and you will not see Hull on the agenda anytime soon. Uh, they've decided to not vote to join us and so uh, we had a wake in the eulogy with them on <laughs> Monday night so you won't see that there but the subcommittee on that which is myself Bob Haywood and Chris Amico will stay on the same as it is in case somebody else comes up to be a standing committee uh, Hey, Tom, I'm going to let you do capital projects and regional planning that's under my okay. uh, I think I think with regional planning, you, you certainly uh, summarized the situation with Hull. I appreciate the work of that subcommittee. Uh, from that regional planning, I'll, I'll just add um, our regional agreement, which in draft form this committee approved, was approved at Whitman's special town meeting on December 11th. Uh, and so we will continue the work of communicating and communicating with our towns as we work towards the spring with the goal of having unanimous support amongst our towns through the spring town meetings in April, May, and June. With regard to capital projects, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to thank uh, several members of this committee that have devoted and continue to devote a lot of time to this, uh, Bob Mola, and Jack Manning and Bob Mahoney, who have attended several meetings with the, uh, the engineering firm DRA. And at this point, we are, we are on track. Uh, we intend to have DRA at our January 24th full school committee meeting for them to make a complete presentation on their findings. We had a meeting on Tuesday, yesterday, where they started to go over the existing conditions report. And they're still awaiting some information from a couple of consultants, a structural engineer and a civil engineer. But we should expect a final report that will be very easy to digest, very easy for this committee to unpack, and begin to prioritize capital projects for the next 10 years. Part of the report will give us the full physical on the buildings and grounds with recommendations. And it will also include at least three schematic drawings of ways that we could better utilize our space and account for an expansion. So it's been they've, been, they've been very efficient, they've been very responsive to our suggestions, and we have tentative meetings, we have meetings scheduled for January 9th and January 16th at 3.30 here in the restaurant for anyone that would like to sit in and hear how things are going. But you as a full committee can expect a complete report on January 24th. Okay, Mr. Superintendent, <coughs> continue your... Okay. 
budget presentation. So you should have a hard copy of this budget presentation in your correspondence file if that's easier. If you'd rather gather around the fake fire, <laughs> I'll, I'll work off the screen here. Sim, similar format to years, to years past here. I always start off by wanting to talk about our school mission statement. We're charged with building a budget that reflects our mission. And our mission is to provide technical, academic, and social experiences so that our students will be college and career pathway ready. They'll achieve competency in technical and academic standards. And they'll develop work habits that foster independence, self-awareness, civic-mindedness, and commitment to personal growth. We have a lot that we have accomplished. The next two slides talk about accomplishments and goals. A lot of print on this slide. Let me go through it at a reasonable pace here. Uh, you heard from uh, Margaret in a previous meeting about our success on the recent round of MCAS tests. High growth scores in ELA and math, as well as unprecedented numbers of vocational, technical, third party credential attainment. We're doing a lot with community outreach Students like Rosa, the Student Ambassadors, Business Professionals of America, Skills USA. We're also reaching out to partner with, we continue to partner with North River Collaborative. This semester we're running an after school carpentry program for students from North River. I'm on the board of directors now for the South Shore Workforce Development Board, which gives me an opportunity to hear directly from employers and state agencies about regional employment needs, as well as to speak on behalf of education. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I made a presentation with uh, two other members of this uh, development group, two members of the Governor's Workforce Skills Cabinet, talking about the employment needs of the region and where schools like South Shore can fit into the solution. We continue to save money through energy efficiency. As you know, you supported us putting new rooftop units on the 1992 edition. You probably have noticed the LED light investment that we made with our electrical uh, department back in September in our main hallways in the 1962 building. And Bob Moorhead enjoys every day having improved climate control monitoring. And uh, we hope that we can take even further steps with that uh, down the road. We expanded our advisory committee this year, inviting all of our co-op employers to be considered advisors. We had a mindset that co-op employers were over here and advisors were over here, but they were both give, able to give us valuable feedback. So starting this year, we invite all co-op employers to join our respective advisory committees and be part of the discussion giving us feedback on our programs. We have increased extracurricular activities in the areas I mentioned earlier with skills and BPA and student ambassadors. We've started a dual enrollment program with Quincy College for grades 11 and 12. We have a Chapter 74 approved horticulture program. We won a skills capital grant for money going into the horticulture program and the machining program. And Katie Berry, our special ed director, who you don't see on a monthly basis but does a fantastic job, is strengthening our relationships with the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission as we help students transition directly to work. That agency has many, many resources that in the past we weren't taking full advantage of. And now I'm very pleased to say that we have a direct connection with them so that students who see the next step out of South Shore Vocational as being direct to work can be given opportunities to work with Mass Rehab. That has proven to be very successful this year. And with a renovated facility, as we always pride ourselves in, you know what we did with the Met Lab, the machine shop area, the investments that we made uh, with the electrical work and the flooring, and with the support of the Skills Capital Grant. We've, uh, in the process, by February vacation, we'll have upgraded our security server software, cameras, and uh, we recently consolidated our student parking to improve traffic flow, especially at the end of the day. And we know, of course, that we have a digital sign out front. So Mr. Arbery will spend no time in the snow traipsing out to tell us happy holidays, then changing the sign in April. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. So all of these accomplishments, your support, budget, the people, the volunteers, our mission continues, it's strong. We're done patting ourselves on the back. We now have to set new goals. We're setting many new goals for this, for this school year. We continue to want to narrow the proficiency gap with our MCAS scores. We continue to want to show strong growth. 
that will always be there. It will always continue to be there. Our curriculum, as I mentioned, dual enrollment with Quincy College, we are looking to take the next step with Quincy College and develop a specific dual enrollment program that focuses on advanced engineering. We'll be developing a soil sciences elective that will be taught for students who end up majoring in our horticulture landscape program, as well as a science elective. As I mentioned with the Capital Projects Subcommittee report, building for the future. We have a master facilities plan underway. That plan will be done by the end of January. That'll be the easy part. And then from there, we'll talk about what portions of it we will prioritize and fund. And with regard to the MSBA program, as I would have reported to you, uh, when the information came in, I'll say at this meeting publicly, we were not invited in to the MSBA's core program. I think we were very close. I'm very proud of the statement of interest that we submitted. And I'll be bringing back to you at the February meeting, using the master facilities plan as a strong reference point, I'll be bringing back another recommendation to resubmit for the items that we consider important for modernization and expansion. Our guidance department, mostly through the, through the upcoming efforts of Joe Madera, who you saw earlier tonight, he'll be leading the way to help us develop stronger connections with parents in the career planning development for 12th graders. We want to make sure that the parents of our seniors coming into senior year are fully informed about all the options that their, ch that their children have. Instructional technology, in this budget that I'm presenting tonight, we will be asking for an increased number of Chromebook carts, which will give us the capacity to be able to say that we will have Chrome cart access in all of our classrooms. Over the last five years, teacher use of laptop technology has increased exponentially, as you would expect. We have to be able to meet their needs by making sure that it, no teacher has to modify a lesson plan because in this classroom there's no smart board, or in this classroom there's no Chrome cart, or there's only 10 laptops here. This budget will bring us to a level that all of our administrators say will fully ensure that teachers will have that technology anywhere in this building where they're teaching classes. And goals for our, for our vocational programming, as you've heard us talk about, uh, we're opening the horticulture landscape program. We'll be placing our first class in there after exploratory in January. The, the MET program, Manufacturing Engineering Tech, that program integration continues. And as you know, we hired a plumbing, uh, a, a plumber, a plumbing instructor to join our HVAC program. Very pleased with the program expansion that's going on there. We anticipate a very strong draw in our HVAC program after exploratory. The instructors have already renovated, uh, they've relocated some of the storage in their shop, at maximizing even more instructional space. We were able to buy some workbenches for them in anticipation of this placement. So a lot of great things for us to uh, circle back to as the school year progresses. So on to the budget process. As you hear, you've heard me say for many years, we have a zero-based budgeting process. We start the budget at zero every year. And for our department heads and cost center, super, uh, cost center supervisors, this gives them an opportunity to itemize their needs. We have a Google Doc for every department, every cost center. Everything gets built up from a blank piece of paper. It allows for very detailed conversations, and it makes it rather easy if we have to make cuts that we can target the areas specifically where it needs to, where cuts need to be made or costs need to be deferred or reprioritized. So right now, this is the beginning of the public discussion as we've been working since October on developing the budget and the rationale behind it. And we will work through this meeting and our meeting in January to continue the discussion. This budget, as I said, it's really embedded in the goal slide, but you will find in this budget that we're going to provide current technology to support the curriculum. We're expanding instruction in, air, in vocational and academic areas. You'll see in this budget that we're, we have an increased need for transportation as well as a modernization of our fleet as we come up to the end of our three-year bus lease. There's capital investment for vocational programming facilities and technology. There certainly is money set aside for maintenance improvements as we continue to make every visitor to this school feel as though this school is as new as any of the other secondary schools in our district. There continues to be an OPEB investment for post-retirement benefits. You will see another stabilization fund recommendation that we can set aside funds for perhaps MSBA feasibility funds so that if we were 
if we, you've heard me say this in, in past years, if we get accepted to this program, it happens in January. We are in the middle of a budget cycle. We, we do not have the ability to then go and ask for a half a million dollars, but the MSBA expects within 270 days to know whether or not we're on board. Having money set aside in stabilization it continues to be a solid strategy for us. It means that we don't have to choose between uh, borrowing money unexpectedly or having a one-year spike in assessments or perhaps telling MSBA we're not ready. We don't want to miss that opportunity and I think we're well poised should we be accepted for our 2018. And as I mentioned, we have a, a expanded expenses for a school bus lease. We control for costs through zero-based budgeting, long-range planning. You'll get in the budget books next month a long-range capital plan, even without the work that we're doing with DRA. We can project out vocational equipment uh, replacement through 2035. We're very ambitious when it comes to competing for grants, and we've been very fortunate to help offset the bottom line with skills capital grants, judicious use of Perkins grants and federal special education grants. We rely on industry connections for vocational donations. And of course, our own in-house talent, as I say year in and year out, our own in-house talent, talented staff, talented students, they do a lot of the work around this building. That, of course, is a sign of great pride for all of us, and it does help with the bottom line as well. So let's get into the details. Tonight I'm bringing you a budget proposal that has an increase in the aggregate of 3.73%. And in the small print underneath that at the top, you'll see that the total budget is approximately 13.4 million. That's an increase of $481,723. What I will say up front and shows up later on this slide, however, is that my projection at this point, with the numbers being where they are, is that with, an in, with a one-year increase in non-resident tuition and with a projection of increased regional transportation, we will actually be in a position to go to our eight towns and assess them less than we assess them for this year by about $25,000. So I think that's going to prove to be very helpful as we move forward. I think it sends a good message that we're continuing to grow. You will see evidence of what we're looking to do in personnel and capital and equipment. And it's also an opportunity in this budget cycle to send a message as we talk more and more about this master facilities plan and the need to do renovations to this building that we may be in a position very soon that we're going to want to do things and we may not wait for MSBA. And so this committee, you will be charged with listening to the Capital Projects Subcommittee and their thoughts and recommendations on what that might mean. Stabilization, short-term borrowing, saving certain projects for MSBA should we be invited. We know that if MSBA were to invite us, you would have to peel off five years <laughs> before you would have a project come to reality. Not every item in this master facilities audit can wait five years, whether it's maintaining the electrical systems or it's what we want to do in many areas which is to expand instructional space. So I mentioned that up front, that's the, that, that's the first among equals in terms of the headliners. Capital money and stabilization in technology and vocational equipment and facilities. For personnel, you'll see that there are some new positions in here. Uh, there's a machining aid position. That's a new position. We had, we had a member of the machining program, the MET program, retire and we're going to replace that position with a paraprofessional position, which we already have the person in place right now. And there's been great value in this model, and I see this model continuing. There's some additional funds for a part-time custodian. We're also moving existing positions that we have on grants onto the budget. This is a good year to do that. Feds don't expect us to keep personnel on grants forever. We've been, we've, we, we try to, we, I try to target this in a, in a cascading way so that it's not too much too soon, but this is a good year to be able to move our adjustment counselor who we've had in place for a couple years, a Title I math teacher, and the horticulture instructor that we hired who's being paid partially on a Perkins grant, we'll be able to roll those positions, embed them in the budget. And we're going, to have an, uh, we're going to have a retirement next year in an administrative assistant position, so there's some additional funds in there for a one-year one overlap of the person retiring and us bringing somebody on board. That will, be, that will be unpacked in a little more detail. 
later in this school year, we'll be coming to you with a recommendation to go out and lease 11 buses. And I can say right now that if I were asked for a specific recommendation, I would be putting out two IFBs, two invitations for bid, looking for 11 buses, propane and diesel. Put them out concurrently and see what the market fetches. In this budget here, propane buses per bus are more expensive than diesel buses, but diesel buses are more expensive to maintain. So this budget here accounts for both options. That is, if we were to decide to uh, ink a new lease on January 1st, 2019 for 11 propane buses, there would be money in the budget to cover that. There would also be money available if we ended up going in a different direction with diesel, cheaper per bus cost, but higher maintenance costs. And we've done some pretty good analysis. Separate meeting to talk about that, but we're not gonna, I, I do not want to tie anybody's hands or our hands collectively in making a decision. A lot may have changed in the market relative to transportation providers, propane technology, and so we want to see what the gap would be. That way we'll have all of our options. Our bus lease currently, seven propane buses, our bus lease is in effect through December 31st of 2018. Health insurance. We are projecting a 12% increase for health insurance costs for active employees. But I will tell you that when you get your budget books next month, you will be pleased to see that based on some refined projections and some changes of health insurance consumption within this district, that the total increase in the health insurance line will not be 12% it will be much less. But what, we're, what we did was we looked at our current, our current consumption of health insurance, family plans, individual plans. We're projecting 12% over that as part of our rationale for, for developing a budget number. As you know, as part of the Mayflower Municipal Health Group, that those numbers are always set later than when we, when we conduct our business. But in conversations with Mayflower uh, that we've had we feel as though that number is a, that is a, that is a solid number. We're not, selling our, we're not cutting ourselves short. And so we'll know more about that in the next few months. But we are always building in a number in advance of actually knowing what the, what the increase is going to be. And as I said earlier, we're going to have non-resident tuition and projected regional transportation helping to offset any increases in the budget, which will, which will be favorable for all town assessments. And another, uh, another uh, line here that's always important to point out, and we point this out when we go to our non-regional communities in our district, is that almost 17% of this budget, or $2.2 million, accounts for items that are not typically found in a school budget, such as health insurance, other insurances, unemployment, snow removal, OPEBs, and, and things of that sort. That's a, that's a standard for us. These, these successive slides here basically break down some of the headliners. So here's, here's the personnel list here. Again, what I do is I, in, in as much detail as I can provide, here we have the three positions we want to move from grant to budget. Here's the paraprofessional position uh, the, for machining. We want to uh, build in some advisor money for grade nine and 10 advisors, an additional teacher mentor, the reestablishment of the robotics club. Money for a part-time custodian who will also have bus driving responsibilities. And as I said, the one year transition cost for an administrative assistant. The last line here talks about new positions using grant money. So there's a zero here. You don't see that too often in a budget presentation. But these positions will have no budgetary impact. Wages and benefits would be built in. And what we're, going to, what we're tentatively prioritizing right now, these grants are well off. We have to, of course, see what happens at the federal level for grants. But we are looking at the potential for using our Title I grant, moving a math teacher off the grant, and looking at an English learner, instructor, or co-teacher. We have five EL students in our building. We have five students. We don't know year to year if we'll have more students who need English language instruction. We don't know the le their level of English fluency. Having an English learner instru credentialed instructor gives us the maximum ability to address their student needs. And in addition, in addition, the way that we're able to offset this particular position is that we have a paraprofessional retiring. So it's going to be, 
it's going to have less of an impact even on our grants to be able to bring this uh, instructor on board. And if the instructor serves as a co-teacher, a co-teacher can also essentially serve in a role that a paraprofessional could serve in. So we're getting the maximum use out of this. We're going to explore this a little bit more. We have until the springtime to write the fiscal 19 grant. We will reassess, but that's a priority. We also have a graphic communications instructor who is currently 0.75 and we'll be able to use a federal special education grant to increase that share of that position. We want to bring a horticulture aid in to support the single teacher we have for next year. And we will be able to use it, again, following, following the logic. We have the teacher partially on the Perkins grant. We move that position onto the budget. Now we can begin to build the next position in this program. And that program will eventually have two full-time instructors. Fiscal 20, you'll definitely have two full-time instructors. And then there's additional funding here through a special education grant for an additional paraprofessional position as our special ed director, Katie Berry, anticipates us having probably 15 students next year who will be best served through workplace training to be on internships. Not co-op, which as we know is full-time, Monday through Friday, shop week uh, experience. An internship could be one day, two days a week, and this paraprofessional would go out with the students to support them in these locations. So that's great, in, that's great planning to be able to put us in a position. And so by running some fixed numbers for, for grants next year, if we didn't get an extra penny of grant money next year and we're level funded across the board, we could bring all these things to life. And I appreciate the work of the administrative team to develop these recommendations and we've got a way to pay for it. That's personnel. Here's capital. Capital requests. The biggest number here, as I said, I'd have a recommendation for a stabilization fund. $250,000 into the stabilization fund. That would require a special vote of this committee to remove any money for it. And this is, again, this is probably the third time that we've done this, putting money aside for building renovations. A couple of specific facilities needs include flooring upgrades as well as some additional cost for paving for walkways. So under capital, for facilities, those are the priorities. I will say this, I'll say it at this point in the presentation. This is a unique year given that we are working on this master facilities audit. And so I would like to say that I may come back to you for our January meeting with some portion of this slide revised. Because we're going to know a lot more. We're going to know a lot more in the next few weeks in terms of that audit and whether or not there are any other items prioritized. So there may be, there may be some items there that it look a little different, or maybe not. But I just want to say that given the timing of this report coming out, that's definitely something we're going to look at. In the area of vocational equipment, we're going to set aside $20,000 for the partial cost of a skid steer loader. We will match that money with a Perkins grant from next year in order to pay for that. And in the area of building technology, uh, our technology director, Crystal Paluzzi, is recommending to me a multi-year replacement of the fiber in the 1992 building. She estimates that between fiscal 18, 19, and 20, we should be able to cover all of our needs, approximately $15,000 a year. That money would account for one phase of that recommendation. And then there are capital funds set aside, as I said earlier in the presentation, for Chromebook carts, for math and science, and elsewhere. And also money set aside for sound system upgrades in the cafeteria and the gym. We know that we are crunched for space. We know that we do a lot of community activities, a lot of community building activities with our, with our student body. And we need to have a sound system and a communication system in our limited public space that we have. So this expense here would allow us to, make, would allow us to do presentations <coughs> and community events with what we would say is a, a state-of-the-art sound system. And the opposite of a state-of-the-art sound system is a portable mic and a speaker that if you don't happen to be standing right in front of it, you might not be hearing what the person's saying. So we definitely can do better with that. This investment will allow us to, to do that. So personnel and capital are, the, are the, really the, the two big headliners. I put in this pie chart just to give you, again, a visual reminder that we have capital items to deal with current needs. And then the biggest piece of this capital pie is obviously looking down the road. And that's what stabilization allows this committee the ability 
uh, to do, to use as needed going forward. A facilities plan, the rest of the facilities plan that doesn't necessarily involve capital, I'm, I'm very happy to say that after, this is, this is my seventh budget, and in the last six budget presentations, our facility plan items have been lengthy. We have had many, many, many things. And you've seen those updates and you, and, and you hear regularly what we're doing. Based on the facilities plan going into fiscal 19, our list, this is probably the shortest list. Not that we won't paint something here or tinker with something there, but in terms of needing funds to target improvements, it's probably the shortest list we've had in a long time. Door replacements, additional classroom renovations. We're now back to looking at the classrooms that we first renovated five or six years ago. Not major renovation, but we're gonna make the best use of the space that we have. We want it to look clean and modern and inviting. Some exterior painting and some additional security enhancements around the building. So all of these funds are non-capital and they are part of the maintenance budget uh, in, in Cost Center 62. The curriculum and instructional technology highlights, again, just to, just to reiterate, expansion of Chromebooks for all classrooms, the dual enrollment text that we're going to need to support that dual enrollment program means that the academic departments will need specialized textbooks. We will continue to support them in that area, and we will continue to support through the budget the soil sciences elective being developed for horticulture and the science department. Okay, now I'm just, so I'm going to get away from numbers for a little bit. Let me segue in and essentially talk, tell you something you already know. Statement of interest for the Mass School Building Authority. There's an aerial view of the school. The part of the school with the white roof is what was replaced in 2011. The roof that you see here, this is our 1992 edition, and that roof is, is original. I put these slides up for the last three years just as a reminder that we continue to go to the School Building Authority looking for some support to address systems issues and space issues. And we will continue to do so. And as I said earlier, feasibility funds are an important first step. And I think we're positioned that were we to be invited next year, that we could, that we could go to our communities for their support, telling them that we have the funds available. Replacing the heating units, inadequate weight room, the modular unit not connected to the building. We continue to chip away at our list. Last year we had rooftop units on the list. We don't anymore. We will continue to <coughs> chip away and, uh, and so that when we do develop a statement of interest, it's going to be something that has our greatest hits involved as well as what comes out of this facilities audit. This slide here essentially summarizes what we've been doing with, uh, with DRA. We're going to end up with a 10-year capital plan. It'll allow us to prioritize future projects. And Again, while this may not be evident entirely on the 24th of January, it may take a little longer to unpack, we're going to be looking at how can we phase in improvements. How do you prioritize and then how do you phase something in? And then we're going to consider how we're going to pay for that. How are we going to fund these projects? Annual budget, stabilization, short-term borrowing, wait for MSBA. Long-term renovations, big ticket items, we would obviously, it would be unwise for us to move ahead with large items if we think that we have a chance of getting MSBA support. And I show you the same aerial view here for those folks who uh, haven't been attending the meetings. Just to give you a sense, if you follow any of those arrows, uh, what are they thinking about right now in terms of what might a potential expansion look like? Well, they, they've come up with a multitude of ideas, many of which <coughs> folks in this room uh, have probably thought about and driven around the building and said, hmm, I think this, we could probably do this or that. They're talking about possibly something that connects the two entrances, or maybe an addition that is using up the land currently where the module unit is, or possibly a series of targeted additions in those shop areas that, that need more space. These plans, what we're, we're not paying for the plans, the engineered plans. We are paying for their expertise to help them tease out some ideas that we can then use for further discussion and further decision making going forward. The good news about how we set up this request for proposal is that if this report generates interest from the committee to say, you know what, I like the idea of adding on right there, we can contract with this engineering firm without having to go back through the procurement process 
if we wanted them to design some sort of structural addition to the building, if we choose to do that. And, and incidentally, Dan, I see, you, I, 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 see, I, I see the thumbs up here go, going up. The, the very last thing that was said at the last subcommittee meeting that they said they would look into and, and embed in their report was the pros and cons of second story and where, where might that work and not work. So again, stay tuned, January 24th, they'll be making a presentation here. All right, the last phase of the presentation deals with enrollment and assessment information. As you know, in December, we don't have assessment information by town. We will on January 24th, Jim will wake up in the morning, Jim will check his email, he will check the mass.gov website, he will wait for the governor's budget numbers to come out, and then he will go and he will produce a document that will be handed out at 7 o'clock, <laughs> which will show what are the minimum contributions for each of our towns, and then we can, make a, we can begin to make an assessment projection. So there's nothing with town-specific assessments tonight. Many of these slides you've seen before. Here's, a, here's an 11-year look back on our school enrollment. 650 students in the building. And as you know, with more students in the building, there comes more cost. Here's a, here's a look back for our communities. This is where I could get to be uh, you know, weatherman here. If there's a look at the fire column over there. You'll see a, you'll see a drop off at Abington enrollment, 28 students fewer. We, gra we, we graduated a very large Abington senior class in the class of 2017. Abington has opened a new school. And we have seen trends and patterns similar when other school districts have opened new schools. Cohasset is down one student. Hanover is down three students. Norwell and Rockland and Whitman are all increased. Hanson and Situate's enrollment has stayed the same. Generally speaking, when enrollment goes up, assessments go up. It's never that simple, but those numbers are important. Those are always numbers that get talked about. These are, of course, taken from October 1 reports that are submitted to the department and are then published on the Department of Education website. When we unpack a town's assessment, these are the factors we look at. This is a slide you've seen before, but I'd like to go through it briefly. The biggest chunk of any town's assessment is their minimum contribution. In fiscal 17, excuse me, in fiscal 18, the minimum contribution accounted for almost 74% or three quarters of a town's assessment. So any of the other factors that we'll be getting into, that's why we have to wait for this from the state and then from there we can project other items. Capital is a three-year rolling average. Transportation is in red, and I, I specifically put it in red because for those of you that remember looking at budget books or looking at assessment sheets, in the past we have labeled this operating or operational costs. And what I usually say is this is the category that's mostly transportation with a little bit of money for our food service program. And so what we're going to bring you this year, just so, we, just so I don't have to put that disclaimer, what we're going to do is we're going to move the $18,000 of food service costs into this category called other costs above the minimum contribution. So that when we publish a column on your assessment chart, it will say transportation. Very clean and clear. That's an, I think that's an important distinction to make. And in the revised regional agreement that, that we've approved here, that's how we're going to, once, it, once it's official, we will continue to do this. So it's not saving us money or costing us any money. It's making it more transparent. If someone wants to ask, how much money are you spending on transportation? They can find it because the column heading will say transportation. And then there are other costs above the minimum. Most school districts in the Commonwealth, if not all, are spending beyond the minimum contribution. And so we have a place to allocate how those numbers break down beyond what is required by statute. These numbers here, transportation and other costs above the minimum, are student population specific. They are not driven by the Chapter 70 formula. They are based on proportion from October 1 enrollment. And then the last category is debt service. That is a fixed amount based on the three years prior to the year that the debt is authorized. We currently carry about $126,000 of debt for the 2011, 2010, uh, 2011 roof and window project. That debt, which is we borrowed for about a million one, 
that debt will roll off in late 2020, early 2021. So any future conversations about us doing or proposing any borrowing, one of the good, I guess one of the good pieces in terms of an offset is that the debt that we're talking about that we have right now, that's not the beginning of a note, we're nearing the end of it. The assumptions that we're making coming into this budget, as I said at the beginning, we are assuming level funded Chapter 70, that we will not get any more than we got this year for Chapter 70. That has generally been the case in December of any fiscal year, that we would not make any, make any assumptions that we would be getting more. Some years that plays out and, and it works, but, but uh, it would not be wise for us to do that this early. We're going to assume a 65% regional transportation reimbursement rate. The word we're getting is that while that is separate from Chapter 70 and that is something that the legislature deals with on an annual basis, which is, it's an, it can be an unreliable number, we feel as though taking all of our transpo costs, assume a 65% reimbursement, the rest of the costs would get baked into the, to the uh, assessments to our towns. And then the non-resident tuition that we're collecting this year that will be applied to next year Will help, will help to offset the bulk of this budget increase. Last slide. Next steps. Public hearing on January 24th. Jim will work the numbers. We'll look at some preliminary numbers, minimum contribution. We'll we still have to set a date on our February meeting, but that'll be when we certify the budget. We have to certify the budget 45 days before our earliest town meeting in our district which is situate in April. We'll begin the road show, February to April, finance committees, advisory committees, and then our town meetings. I'll just point out, although it has no budgetary impact, what is special about this spring's town meeting, as I said earlier, the, our town meetings, is that we will not only have a line in the respective town budgets, but there will also be an article dealing with our revised regional agreement. So that's, a, you know, the last time we would have dealt with both a budget and an article would have been for the debt on the roof project in, in the, uh, the 2010 town meetings. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Can I answer any questions? I do have a question, Tom. The, I see the drop off in Abington, I believe it was 28 students. Yes. The last town to do that new school, I believe, was Whitman Hanson a few years ago. How did we do there? Was there a specific drop in the same area? There, there, was, there was a drop, Tom, I think I can, if you bear with me, let's, let's take a look. Yeah, so Whitman Hanson High School is, what do you say, Dan, 10 years old? A little under 10 years old? So you can see a, you can see a drop off here down to 92 students, right around 09, and today there's 148. So we rebound. That has been, that's been the pattern. And again, every, every year, different group of students, different group of interests, different group of needs. But if we wanted to look, if, you know, if past is prologue, a new, a new secondary school does draw more attention. It's a beautiful school, a lot of great resources there. But we have yet to see a new secondary school be a permanent plateauing mm -hmm. of one's enrollment numbers. We also, uh, Tom, on that, the economy jobs, if employment is high, the tendency is to lose students. But the minute the employment is low, there's the demand for the trades and the employees that way, then it goes up. For example, you know, like right now, em employment is down except for the trades. There's a demand for the work, and that's why we're getting students in. The parents realize that they've got a job uh, instead of going to college and be unemployed. I have a question, Tom. With our new horticultural class, are we teaching in that class uh, the use of chemicals for lawns and things like that? Eventually, not. I, I don't see that happening during this school year here. Okay, I think when we finally get to that position, <coughs> excuse me, and we start teaching that, <clears throat> we should think about doing a night class because I know a lot of uh, uh, people who do it on a part-time basis cannot fertilize lawns legally they need to get a license and I think that you're going to get especially a lot of firefighters who are doing landscaping 
on their off day. Pesticide application license. Right, this is my job. Would come here nights to take that class, be able to purchase or, or take that license test and be able to uh, finish their landscaping as far as um, adding chemicals to people's lawns legally. So it's right. just something to think about. Always, always looking to extend the, the use of the school after hours, especially in the workforce areas we offer during the day. I think there's a similar uh, situation with air conditioning and buying the um, replacement for 134A, which is used in automotive. And I think the classification is 609. And I believe that in order to purchase refrigerant, you have to have the 609 uh, license. And so that's also a course in the certification that you have to pass. I know uh, ASE offers that as well as uh, other companies. So perhaps that could be a course that could be offered to technicians in yes. the evening. We're, we're definitely fans of industry recognized credentials for our day students and yes, that's, an, that's another area. Advanced manufacturing is one that's getting a lot of press as well, running post-secondary programs there as well. So basically, Tom, we're having our next meeting the fourth Wednesday of the month? That's correct, okay. yes, in, in dovetailing with the governors. It, it would not make much sense to have our, right. a, the third Wednesday with no solid information from the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. I just want to make one more comment to staff. Uh, some of those programs that came on board were from the ideas and the great work from the superintendent himself and the great ideas that came from the importance of the school council committee. Uh, they do great work uh, behind the scenes with this. some of the faculty, administration, students, staff, community. Uh, they, they're the ones who brought in and spearheaded some of the programs. Uh, the, to the hustle in the background to bring it in to the superintendent and then he's taken the ball and ran with it very well. And uh, as we're finding out, those are being pretty uh, productive okay. programs well, that are coming into our school in the and the fact that we get the, the new sign out front too, which is from the school council. So um, that saves Mr. Aubrey a lot of time. Yes, it does. Chasing letters down the street. <laughs> Okay, Tom. Mr. Chairman, uh, in order to improve our meeting average time, I'm happy to report that I'm not going to continue with items two, three, and four. There are no administrative reports, and I already covered the other two things during that. So we can, we can move on. I have one comment on four, though, and that's uh, a regional agreement. And I'm going to thank Dan and Whitman for this, because it sort of locks in if we have one of our other seven towns, although we visit them all, talk to them, and told them what we're doing. There's no way in God's earth, good earth that we can change anything now because Whitman has locked it in for us. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't very difficult. I mean, our town administrator, Frank Lanham, got up, he read, he read the agreement, uh, and uh, he spoke on it. He said basically there was the only changes were due to update and, and state languages and things <laughs> like that. And you know, with Honor Tom, you were in the back of the room. Did you hear his presentation? I did. He did a great job yeah. on my behalf. And right, I mean, I was waiting. I was waiting I was, to see you come in, but I didn't see. You. I didn't have to go any further than the and, back, uh, and I got to leave before the marijuana article. So right. you know, I got out early. <laughs> and of course, we had the uh, the electronic he left on uh, units using it, and it oh. passed. Oh. How much you could resist? But it's uh, you know, if someone, oddball person in one of our town town meetings, well, why can't they change this? It's already been approved in other towns. An amended, an amended regional agreement in any of the remaining towns would essentially be a no vote. Yeah. Okay. Unfinished business. None. New business. Go ahead, Tom. Mr. Chairman, document eight is just a, it's a memory aid uh, that I supplied you a couple of months ago with a series of policies that MASC has recommended needing small tweaks. Uh, so if I, I'm not asking for any action tonight, but it's just a reminder that you were given these policies and as it is broken down, there's either changes of terminology, legal references in the policy, or the policy code. And so what I'll ask is that we, we have this as a voting item for our January meeting. If anyone needs copies of these policies, uh, I'll make sure that we uh, get them out to you in advance of January 24th. Uh, but that's all I w wanted to report on that. Thank you. Donations. Horticultural slice cedar. I'll make the motion that we accept the donation. Hanover. A second. Second Whitman. 
Any discussion? Seeing none, send them a letter of thanks. Please. Let's see, pass unanimous. Uh, Millie Machine for Machine Engineer Technology. Mm -hmm. Motion? Make the motion. motion. Whitman, Whitman, second. Hanover, any discussion? Seeing none, letter of thanks. Uh, surplus declaration. We can do that all in one vote if you want, Mr. I'll make hey, the motion. We accept all okay. four items. Who did that? Rockland? No. Oh, situate? I'll Seconded I'll by I'll who? Second. Second. Whitman? Yeah. All in favor? Uh, Unanimous. Uh, hey, warrants. Don't, don't miss out on my speech there. No, oh. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> it's a done deal. <laughs> Automatically done. Mr. Mahoney wants to make sure that if somebody else can use it, especially a municipal agency. I will I will ask the administrators <laughs> to wheel the Savin copy machine down Webster Street as we before the end. <laughs> Yes. But okay. I, I, I will say, incidentally, Mr. Chairman, that that is, that is an example of a policy that I would be bringing this committee before the end of the school year to put in writing what our procedures will include yes. so that that is embedded in a written policy. Okay. Uh, request for action. The chair has oh. one. Oh. If you go over to oh. your... I'm sorry, but oh. on, just warrants. Oh. 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 Okay, warrants. <laughs> Who's doing it? Dan, you no, still Chris, doing that? Chris has got Chris, it. Chris, Chris has got it. That's me. Uh, warrants for approval, warrants number 10 and 11, totaling $1,042,079.64. Second. Second by Whitman. No. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Okay, request for action from the chair. Uh, please review what you have on budget uh, uh, information. So that and get it back to Tom if you have any serious questions or you'd like to look at an addition or subtraction. Uh, it'll save having a special meeting if we need it. Uh, and the other is to I don't know whether you all read the legal alerts or not that came in the from the association. You probably haven't got them yet, George. Sure. Uh, but there are several items in. Uh, I would say if we haven't already done it, we're going to be hearing from Tom on some stuff that we have to do. One of them is drug pregnant workers and stuff like that will be on uh, negotiations for uh, contracts and so forth. But uh, just be aware that those could be coming up. Um, okay, the other comment I have is to Tom directly. Um, no executive session. No. Mr. Whitman. Yeah, we're all due respect. Motion to adjourn. Seconded by Abington. No discussion. It's non-debatable. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Aye. Aye.